Sponsored by Skillshare. Get two months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Link in the description. When Apple introduced the sixth generation 9.7 inch iPad with Apple Pencil support starting at 329, many of us called it the best deal in tech. Now, Apple has introduced the seventh generation 10.2 inch iPad with Apple Pencil and smart keyboard support, still starting at 329. And the question is obvious. Is it now an even better deal? So, is it? I'm Renee Ritchie, and this is the iPad 7 review, one month later. Last year's entry-level iPad felt like the love child of the original iPad Air and the iPad Air 2. This one, not surprisingly, feels much the same, except now one of the parents is the iPad Air 3. The color options are the same, silver, space gray, and gold. So is the design, all bezels and touch ID. The size is almost the same as well. Same height, same weight, just ever so slightly thicker and heavier, not that I can really notice. The iPad 7 display at 10.2 inches and 2243 by 1668 pixels is also comfortably bigger than last year's iPad 6, which was 9.7 inches at 2048 by 1536, but not quite as big as this year's iPad Air 3, which is 10.5 inches at 2160 by 1620 pixels. And that I can notice, but only when holding them side by side, using either one of them alone and the difference is small enough that it effectively disappears. The same isn't so true with the rest of the display tech though. The iPad 7 isn't laminated like the Air 3, it doesn't have the same anti-reflective coating, it's sRGB rather than the wider DCI P3 gamut, and it doesn't have Apple's true tone ambient color temperature matching, so it can look a little blue in warm light and a little yellow in cold light. It's also not 120 hertz dynamic refresh like the last couple of iPads Pro. I notice all of that because I'm used to the iPads that have all of that, and it's really hard going back. Coming from an iPad Air 1 or older, or an iPad 5 or 6, you'll see no difference because there's just no difference to see. Other than the display now is bigger than any of those, and for the target market, kids and parents, first timers and long timers, education and enterprise, bigger is better. For productivity, it lets you side-by-side -side apps bigger, web browser on one side, notes on the other, Keynote or pages filling the screen, Microsoft Office the app, or G Suite the website, now in desktop class Safari. For creativity, it lets you draw or paint or compose or edit just that much more easily. 9.7 to 10.2 inches doesn't sound like it makes that much of a difference, but at this scale, when you touch it, when you use it, it makes all the difference. Now, some people might assume anyone interested in buying a $329 iPad isn't really that interested in the silicon running it. I'm not those people. Just because price might be the highest thing on the feature list doesn't mean performance and power efficiency aren't right up there as well. Because what you pay is important, but the value you get for what you pay is even more important. So here, at the heart of the machine, you have Apple's A10 Fusion. It's the chipset that debuted with the 2016 iPhone 7, and Apple's first performance dot efficiency processor. It's not the A1210 powerhouse that's in the current generation of iPads Pro, the ones that make Intel's Core M just cry. It's not the regular A12 and the 10.5 inch iPad Air from earlier this year either. In point of fact, it's exactly the same A10 Fusion that was in last year's 9.7 inch iPad 6. So on one hand, there's no upgrade here at all. But on the other, I don't think many people, if any people are upgrading entry level iPads every year either. No school or enterprise mass purchasers especially. I would have loved to have seen Apple take the iPad to A11. Sorry, I'm never not gonna use that line. The additional and independent cores would have been great to offset the extra pixels in the display and to add to the overhead for future operating systems and software updates. And the first gen neural engine block would no doubt have helped with machine learning tasks. In practice though, I haven't seen any real impact, at least not so far. The A10 still has enough performance to handle the web and apps as well this year as last. That includes some of the more strenuous augmented reality and art apps I tried out, which is what will likely be most important to kids using them at home and at school and companies using them in the office and out on the field. It's not gonna handle the highest end creative or pro apps with anywhere nearly the speed, scalability, or aplomb, of course. But that's why there are higher end iPads for pros. As to the headroom, we're just gonna have to wait and see how long the A10 remains, not just supported, but sufficient. My guess is a few years still, at least. Wi-Fi is the same as last year and the same as the Air 3 as well, up to 866 megabits per second MIMO. Bluetooth is 4.2, unlike the 5.0 on the Air. 
Sale error has been boosted to gigabit though, which is a big improvement over last year's 300 megabits per second and on par with the Air. Great news for anyone who's looking or needing to take the iPad out on the road. Battery life has been consistent for me as well. Apple rates it at the exact same 10 hours of web surfing on Wi-Fi, nine hours on cellular is pretty much every other iPad ever, mini, Air, Pro, whatever. And year after year, they've gotten just really good at nailing that number. The biggest thing I didn't like about last year's entry level 9.7 inch iPad 6 was the camera system. Well, this year's entry level 10.2 inch iPad 7 has kept the exact same one. The good news, or worse news, depending on your perspective, is that it's also still really not that far behind this year's iPad Air 3 or iPad Mini 5 either. They're all 8 megapixel f2.4 with 1080p 30 frames per second video on the back, which isn't great for me because I'm hooked on the current iPhone 11 Pro's 12 megapixel f1.8 with 4K 60 frames per second. Likewise, the front camera is the same 1.2 megapixel 720p sensor as last year, not the updated 7 megapixel 1080p sensor on the new Air 3, which is kind of a crime against selfies. And I mean, I get it, Apple wants to hit a low, low price point with the non-pro iPads in general, and the entry-level iPad in particular. That means something has to give, there have to be compromises, and with the screen getting bigger, there's no budget left for the camera system to get better, at least not this year. But it does mean I can't recommend you use these as your primary cameras to capture your most important memories, not unless they're absolutely the only option you have. For most intended use cases though, for anyone who just needs to shoot a photo or some video to use for a project at home or at school, or scan a document at work or on the road, these cameras are serviceable. Still, I'd love it if Apple could find a way for them to be more than that, even on the entry level. The Apple Pencil story on the entry level iPad is the same this year as it was last. It uses the original first generation pencil. Yes, the one that you can quick charge in the lightning port at the coffee shop and will be made fun of up until and maybe even after it saves your butt by letting you do just that. Thanks to iPadOS or iOS 13 for iPad, it's even more responsive than ever before. And yes, it still works with a Logitech Crayon as well if that's what you prefer to use or deploy. I loved it when Apple introduced the pencil with the original iPad Pro in 2015, and I still love it today. No digitizer layer, no extra air gap, no reticule, just fast, satisfying, draw what I want, and what I want gets drawn. It's not as singular an object or as convenient to charge as a magnetic Apple Pencil 2 that works with the current generation iPads Pro, but it still works great. What's new on the accessory side this year is smart keyboard support, which I also love. I'll go so far as to guess the entire reason Apple went with this size for the entry level iPad is so that it could fit the full size smart keyboard Apple debuted with the 10.5 inch iPad Pro and re up with this year's 10.5 inch iPad Air. I've been using one day in, day out since they came out in 2017 and I'm still really happy with it. It works great, it feels great, and it's pretty much spill proof, which is especially great for education and a lot of other sectors. I think I even like this origami like version more than the next gen folio model Apple began selling with the current iPads Pro. Because I just don't have to feel the keys, like bubble wrap against my fingers when I'm holding it up. Should an iPad need a pencil and a keyboard? Should paper need a pen or a typewriter? Yes and yes. Fingers are great, but sometimes you want the precision of the pencil and the speed of the keyboard. And having both doesn't make the iPad any less of a tablet. It makes it more of a tool. This year, the entry-level iPad has a bigger screen and an optional smart keyboard. If you want a one-line review or summation, that's it. But it belies just how much better those two differences make this new iPad, especially with a price that stayed exactly the same, 329. For perspective, a couple of years ago, Apple introduced a 10.5 inch iPad Pro starting at 649, and I loved it. It was my primary iPad, which means my primary computer for everything but video for over a year until the current 11 inch version came out. Now, just over two years later, Apple is introducing a 10.2 inch iPad starting, like I said, at 329. It doesn't have the same display, camera, or even starting storage, but it runs all the same apps with the same pencil and even the same keyboard. So functionally, it's not too dissimilar to the old Pro. And again, starting at only 329. Last year, I called the iPad 6 half a Pro for half the price. Since then, Apple has seriously escalated the Pro with a new design and new capabilities. So much so, I can't call the iPad 7 three quarters of a Pro for a third the price and be done with it. I'm terrible at fractions anyway. 
but I'm also amazed at how well and how fast Apple continues to push iPad Pro technology down into not just the mid-range, but the entry-level iPads as well. I mean, who could have guessed the biggest rival to the 2019 iPad Air would legit be the 2019 iPad nothing? But it is, it totally is. And for anyone not wanting to spend a dollar more on an iPad than they absolutely have to, or are buying in bulk for education or enterprise, this new iPad is absolutely the new, better, best value in tech today. And if you're getting it for school or for work and you really wanna up your productivity levels, check out Thomas Frank on Skillshare as well. Thomas Frank of YouTube and College Info Geek offers a productivity masterclass. Learn to create a simple, customized productivity system that will transform your personal and professional life, allowing you to go after your dreams and achieve your goals. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in video, audio, business, and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high quality classes on must know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today and get two months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. To sign up, visit the link in the description and start learning today. Thanks Skillshare and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. So that's the 2019 iPad, the seventh generation, one month later. The new entry level for everyone who just wants an iPad to do pretty much everything and anything they need. Everything and anything not full on pro at least. But now I wanna hear what you think. Hit like if you do, hit subscribe if you haven't already, pencil jab that bell gizmo so YouTube will actually alert you when future shows get posted, and then hit up the comments and let me know. Is this the entry level iPad update you've been waiting for? Thanks for watching, see you next video.